Lynn and I, when the Jonathan went into uh, permanent uh, support of accommodation, uh, we had not been able to have any holidays up until then, so we decided that we were going to take ourselves and see the world a bit. And uh, last talk time I talked about Peru. Um, this time I'm going to talk about a tour that we took of India in 2009. Um, fantastic country. Uh, we started off in Amritsar, which is very near the border between India and Pakistan in the, the, the northwest of India. And of course, it's the famous site of the Sikh Golden Temple. First of all, we went to the border. This is the scene on the border. Every single day, when they close the border between India and Pakistan, and India celebrates its national heritage uh, rather aggressively, as you will see. Similar on the Pakistani side, but not so many people. <laughs> Gradually the flags come down and they do this every night. So that was our first introduction to the India-Pakistan border. These two countries really do have a kind of love-hate relationship with each other because they've been doing this ceremony, I think, for about 50 years every day. And uh, although it's very aggressive, it's done in very good form. And we went there again this year and uh, they've, in fact, it's even bigger now and it's much bigger on the Pakistani side. Many more Pakistani visitors coming to see the ceremony of closing the border every day. Then we went on to see the Golden Temple. Amritsar is where the Sikhs have their holiest place in the world. And this is the, the Golden Temple, which is in the middle of a pond. And we saw it, first of all, at night. It's absolutely fantastic at night, all, all, all lit up uh, at night. Um, it was built in 1577, but it was destroyed by the Muslims, and it was rebuilt in 1809. So the one you see just now was built in 1809. And it was gilded in 1830. The local Maharaja gave a whole lot of gold so it could be gilded. And they get about 100,000 visitors a day. And they feed every single one of them. Whenever you go to a Sikh Gurdwara, anywhere, there's one in Glasgow, uh, one of the things you get is you get a free meal. And they feed everybody. It doesn't, you don't have to be a Sikh. You can be anybody at all. You get a meal. Let's do some muting here. Right. Um, they also have an awful lot of chapatis. The meal basically is a sort of basic meal with some dal and chapatis and stuff, vegetarian meal. And uh, there they are, some of the girls making chapatis. Very atmospheric place. It's guarded by Sikhs. The Sikhs are a fairly kind of warlike group. And here they are making chapatis the old fashioned way. And here they are making it the modern way. This is your modern Kenwood chef. And I'm an engineer, so I love these sort of things. A chapati making machine. And there's the people getting their meal. And as I say, they feed 100,000 people every day. And of course, you have to wash the dishes. So there they are washing the dishes afterwards. After we've been to Amritsar, we went to Delhi. And frankly, I've been to Delhi now four times, I think, in my life. And I find it one of the most uninteresting places on the face of the earth. Um, New Delhi is very sort of sanitized almost, uh, and Old Delhi is very crowded and very full of traffic. Uh, so I've kind of glossed over Delhi, and the next place we went to after that was Varanasi, which used to be called Benares, holy city on the river Ganges. And the first thing we saw was again a, a sunset ceremony, and this is what they call Arti, which is a ceremony of thanks to uh, Ganga, which is the river Ganges, which is considered a god by the Hindus. Here they are having their, their ceremony. On shell to start the ceremony, they make you insane and fire weaving. Next day we went for a row on the, the river Ganges. They use the Ganges for absolutely everything. Um, they bathe in it, they wash their laundry in it, they bury their bodies by putting their ashes in it. Here's the dobe and the people doing the laundry. 
There's people bathing, immersing yourself in the Ganges is a very good cleansing thing from a spiritual point of view. And then we went on after that um, towards Rajasthan and we were entertained. Unfortunately, I haven't any video of this, but it was a very pleasant uh, Indian classical dance presentation that we got. It was a very good trip. There was a, a small group of us. There were only seven altogether plus a guide. Uh, Mr. Edwards is waving away at us. He wants to say something. Do you want to say something? Oops. Oops. When you go, oh, I, I'm trying to unmute Maureen Edwards, but I'm not succeeding. To <laughs> no, I can't unmute it. Right, anyway, um, from there we went on to see a step well. These were done to get water, but they were kind of a very, very big uh, architectural achievements. And people went down all these steps to the water at the bottom. They're dug in the desert in Rajasthan. And there are rather a few of them on the left. This is one of the, the better ones. And they're absolutely massive. You can see there, you can see the water down at the bottom. This little green bit where the algae are growing is the water. Uh, absolutely massive construction um, to bring water because Rajasthan in the main is desert. So they have to have wells for the water. You can see typical Hindu architecture there, the elephants holding the roof up. Next to the step well, there was a country potter and he produced, you can see the wee collection of pots there. He produced all of these in literally a few seconds from this big dot of clay on a wheel, which was no motor. It was rotated by a stick. You can see the stick there beside it. And he used that to shove the wheel around um, to make it spin and then made all these little pots. Meanwhile, his wife was making chapatis. That's a typical Indian home and the lady making chapatis at home. And we went uh, then to Jaipur where this snake had a go at me. I, <laughs> I sincerely hope it was defined. <laughs> These two guys were trying to get money being snake charmers and his snake had a very definite uh, lunge at me. <coughs> then we saw a puppet show. This is uh, Rajasthani puppets at the best. <laughs> It was a very good show. I, I couldn't do India without including the Taj Mahal. I know it's a bit of a cliche, but we just happened to be uh, in Agra on a lovely day. So we really got beautiful weather. And of course, we couldn't resist the temptation to do the, the Lady Die shot. Uh, we were back there this year in February. And uh, it was quite interesting. The crowds were so, so much bigger. There were many, many more people. You couldn't have taken that picture in February this year because of so many people there. But the other thing was the pollution was so bad uh, that there was a haze everywhere, not just in Agra, everywhere in India, there was a lot of haze. And I saw some pictures just yesterday on the television. Uh, and one of the things the coronavirus epidemic has done is it cleaned up the atmosphere and you can now see things again. There's now better, cleaner air. Taj Mahal is an absolutely magnificent building. As you probably know, it was the, the tomb of Mumtaz, who was the favorite wife of Shah Jahan. And 20,000 people built it. And it was built, they started building it in 1632 um, and they finished it in 1643. And Shah Jahan himself is buried in there as well. But it was a tomb of a mausoleum uh, for the wife of Shah Jahan. And I think it was a great show off piece as well. We really wanted to show how powerful the, the Mughal Empire was. It's made of semi-precious stones inlaid into sandstone. And you can see there the guy doing some uh, repair work on it. Um, the, the stonework is absolutely magnificent everywhere. Great detail. We then went down south to the south of India and we went to a tea plantation. And this is a typical tea. It's, it's the camellia bush they used to make tea. And this particular plantation was harvested by hand. They didn't use machines. They had a lot of people harvesting the tea. Two leaves and a bud of leaves is what you pick. And there were the bags of picked tea um, ready to be picked up by the and taken off to the tea processing plant. And then finally, after that, we went down to Kochi, which used to be called Cochin. And the standard thing they always show you in Kochi is the Chinese fishing nets. Um, these are a tourist attraction now. I don't think they make very many fish out of them. And they dip these down into the water 
and they've got a cantilever structure and then they pick up the fish and they sell them afterwards. So there's the fish that they've got. But you're hardly going to make your living, I don't think, selling that number of fish. That was a day's catch from one group of fishermen. We then went to see in the south of India, they've got a, a dance uh, system called Kathakali. And it's a very ritualized uh, form of dance. All the performers are male and they dress up very elaborately. We were very lucky we got to see them putting their makeup on uh, before the dancing. And this is uh, the performance in, in, in process. There is Sri Krishna, which is the, the guy that we were just looking at, and a gentle woman who was the other person in it. And there's the gentle woman. And the, the gestures and performances, just absolutely fantastic. This was him demonstrating some of the moves that they make. Here was the actual performance. And finally, we went off on a converted rice, rice boat. I think very few of these are actually converted rice boats. Most of them are modern boats, like the one you can see <coughs> by me in this picture, which has just been built for the tourist trade. But the original ones were rice barges that had been converted into tourist houseboats. And we went on the backwaters of Kerala in, in one of them. So that really is a kind of snapshot of uh, some of our experiences in India. I hope you've enjoyed me sharing it with you. And uh, I'll be very happy to answer any questions. Every, I always hear that India is a complete contrast between extremely poor and extremely rich. You didn't show, uh, perhaps for very good reason, uh, much in the way of squalor and poverty. Is it? Is it? Any, did you? Did you see that, or did you? Or did your guide avoid it for you? No, no. Um, yeah, I think what you say is very true. I actually grew up in India. My dad worked in India when, when mm. I was a teenager, so so I know India quite quite well. And yes, it's very very true that India has got vast extremes of poverty. The poor are extremely poor, and the rich are extremely rich. And the rich think the poor are extremely undeserving. So the rich don't have any empathy with the poor whatsoever. It really is a contrast of great, great cult, uh, contrast that way. <laughs> but the, I'm not trying to advocate the Hindu religion, but the Hindus sincerely believe in a cycle of birth and rebirth. And they really believe that if you're a good poor person, your chances of being reborn as a rich person or a more privileged person next time round are, are quite good. And the... It's, it's amazing, but the poor really do accept the lot. They're quite happy. Um, we lived in the jungle when I was a teenager um, in, near a, a village, and the huts were made out of uh, just mud and, and mutty, as they call it, and straw. People had no money whatsoever. They maybe had one cow or a couple of goats. Um, they were almost on the poverty line, and yet they were very happy people. So yeah. I'm not trying to justify the, the, the differences, but the differences in India are absolutely vast. And particularly places like Mumbai, um, there's these massive great slums. And literally right next to the massive great slums, you've got bloody great Hilton hotels, you know, 40-story hotels um, with five stars and, and all, the, all the trimmings. And they somehow or other managed to rub along together <coughs> quite nicely. So in spite of the big, big differences, they do actually um, get on with each other remarkably well in India. Thank you. <coughs> George. Okay, I was going to ask you about the caste system. It's always amazed me that society, uh, so ancient as the Indian one, um, hasn't evolved in some way, but it seems to be um, ingrained. ingrained. Uh, how does that work? Well, first of all, officially, the caste system doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi um, decided that he was a great uh, supporter of the untouchables, the, the lower classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, he basically regarded them as being God's chosen people and decided that all the others were, were, were jumped up and above their station. And uh, he got them to pass a law which abolished the caste system altogether. But uh, our guides um, uh, were quite adamant um, that that hasn't really worked. Um, yeah. Caste still is very much a, a, a thing in India. And at the top of the tree, funnily enough, you have the Brahmins who are the religious leaders. So it's a bit like uh, Europe was way back in the, in the Middle Ages. Um, the church, the, the, the Hindu religion is, is, is right at the top of the tree. So the Brahmins are the, are the upper, upper caste. 
um, and the religious people. <coughs> Next to them is the Rajput, who are the military people and the, and the rulers. So the, the Maharajas and, and the rulers and what have you, they come underneath the Brahmins. So it's why you find sort of strange things. You find a Maharaja who owned a major, major territory and had a major city and thousands, or hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people under his uh, rule. Um, if he wanted to do something, he went and asked the Brahmin for permission to, to, to do it because the Brahmin was a higher caste than, than he was. And a lot of the Brahmins were poor um, hermits and, and, and monks and things like that, but they still were very, very powerful. <coughs> then underneath that, there was a kind of artisan caste of uh, uh, people like uh, millers and, and joiners and plumbers and that, that sort of thing, what, 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 what we even call artisans. And then everybody else, which is the vast majority of the population, were in this caste, which is, was referred to as untouchable. And they, they went through various different levels, right down to the, the worst ones, where the ones that did, dealt with dead bodies and with sewage. Um, and uh, basically, they, they literally were untouchable. And what our guide said in the last time we were there was that this system is ingrained in India because your name gives away your caste. Yes. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons why an awful lot of Sikh people use the name Singh, because <laughs> it basically it hides their caste by not using their, their actual surname, but by using Singh, they are hiding the fact. And they're probably hiding the fact they're of lower caste. If they actually are Rajput, they usually use their proper Rajput name, um, which defines the fact that they're they're upper crust people. And if they're not Rajput, then they use the name Singh um, to say, well, I'm not telling you what I am. But, so officially, it's been done away with. Unofficially, it's still very much there. Right. Complex society, then. Very complex. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Eldon, has Eldon still got a question? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Um, one, one thing that I was absolutely amazed at, you didn't have the, the, the actual smells of, involved in, in what you did. Did, did you, did, when, you were, when you were doing your thing, did you, did you actually have, you know, things over your nose and mouth and face? What, what about smells? I mean, we have a curry here. It's lasts for years, just about. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you either like the smell or you don't like the smell, but there definitely is a smell in India. And in places like uh, Varanasi, it's extremely intense. I mean, the burning ghats there, they were burning. The last time we were there, there were 10 funeral pyres going simultaneously on the burning ghats. So there's, there's all these bodies being burned. There's all, they put the rubbish out in the street and there are wild pigs. They really are wild. They're not owned by anybody that roam the streets and eat the rubbish. So, so basically that's the, the waste disposal system. You well, chuck your rubbish out the door and the pig comes and eats it. <coughs> so yes, the smell's pretty grim um, if, you, if you don't like that sort of thing. But it's amazing how quickly you get used to it. And a lot of places have a very distinctive smell. When we went to India as a, as a child, when I was a teenager, I used to fly in the good old Boeing 707 and the 707 couldn't get from Europe to India in one go, so we had to make a whole lot of separate jumps. And one of the places we jumped to was Cairo. We used to land in Cairo quite frequently. And we never got out of the airport, we went to a transit lounge at Cairo. And the smell in Cairo was overpowering and not at all pleasant. Well, <coughs> in India, it's the opposite. There is a strong smell, but it's quite pleasant, quite frankly. I, I don't regard it as an unpleasant smell, the, the, way, the way that uh, most places in India, but there definitely is a smell. You've got a good point there. Thank you, thank you. Ben. Hi there. Is there any form of healthcare system or do the poor just get on with it and die? Uh, well, yes, uh, to the answer to both these questions. India has exceptionally good healthcare. They've got very, very well qualified doctors and we have quite a large number of them actually work for the NHS here in the UK. Uh, yes. they have a lot of hospitals. But the bottom line, unfortunately, is that the vast majority of the healthcare system is private medicine, which means that you have to pay money <coughs> to go to hospital and get treatment. So yes, the poor go hang, and yes, they have an excellent health service. But it's not free, you pay for it. I'd first of all like to say thank you again, John, for one, setting up the meeting, because I suspect we would struggle to do this without you. In fact, I know <laughs> we would struggle to do this without you. And secondly, for a second, Excellent lecture. I noticed that uh, Eric Moffat joined us late and just to show him that he's not forgotten, <laughs> I'll stick his name tally 
uh, to the next meeting. It may well be slightly yellowed in colour by the time we get around to another face-to-face -face <coughs> meeting. But yeah. I, have, uh, I have actually been to India myself. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did you it, Elliot? The year uh, before the Commonwealth, last Commonwealth Games. Oh, yeah. When the, uh, the part of the new motorway they were building, the high-level high motorway came down. Oh. Killed, so... Numerous people. So that must have been about the same time as that. It was 2009 that that, that, that particular visit that I did was, and they were building uh, the subway in Delhi. They were ex uh, extending the subway for the Commonwealth Games, and that's been a great success. That the the metropolitan, particularly the subway system, but the metropolitan trains in Delhi are now really excellent. They go all the way out to the airport, and they're building new lines at the present.